this is uh, from furlough to unfurlough, <laughs> which is a interesting title and I'm going to let our speakers tell us more about that but um, thanks ever so much to Machin's solicitors for um, running this webinar to, uh, presentation today. Um, just to advise, um, we are recording the webinar so if you don't want to be on view please just turn your screen off. Um, if you have any questions you can either pop them in the chat um, but if not, we'll pick them up at the end. We're going to have a Q&A after the presentation, so if you can just hang on to those until the end, I'd be grateful. So I'm going to hand over to Jackie, Jackie Conneen, who is a partner at Machins, um, to begin the presentation. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks, Alison. Morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this session. So furlough has been described as a waiting room for unemployment. Um, it's essentially bought time for employers um, to think about those difficult business decisions they may have put on hold for a period because of the government scheme whilst everything's been in lockdown. Uh, but now things are opening up. Um, there's going to be more uncertainty. We don't know what's ahead. One thing we do know, there's going to be further disruption to working arrangements. We may have waves of this epidemic, so be in and out of lockdown and have people isolating. Um, a recent survey by um, People Management found that 42% of employers had expected to make more employees redundant when the furlough scheme ends in October. 59% would have made up to a quarter of staff redundant had the scheme not been introduced in the first place. So you can see those decisions have been parked, but now it's very much a focus for employers on planning for the future, trying to future-proof their businesses as things open up. Um, trying to see what their future holds. Um, so re revisiting those decisions if they were considered first time around for the scheme, uh, looking at what you can do with staff, what the options are and so on. And in this webinar today, what we'll be doing is looking at the scheme as it is, the changes to the scheme, flexi furlough, coming out of the scheme, but also alternative options outside of that scheme. So bringing changes to the business to introduce flexibility, going forward, um, but also trying to avoid redundancies, but if that can't be avoided, um, or it's part of the plan, how to implement those redundancies. And as part of this, we'll be looking at uh, vulnerable employees in particular, um, and the risks that they pose for the employer. So I'm now going to hand over to David. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes quite briefly talking about uh, the current and the new furlough scheme. Um, it, a bit old news, really. I think if it's not something you're aware of, um, you're probably not using it and, and probably not going to use it. So I won't spend a long time explaining it. But uh, the government announced, um, obviously, a week or so ago that there was going to be a new furlough scheme, a, a scheme 2.0, um, that's going to start on the 1st of July. Um, the old scheme, the current scheme, is going to close on the 30th of June, um, but effectively, uh, unfortunately, as of yesterday, it's closed to new entrants. Uh, that's because access to it required three weeks, and essentially there aren't three weeks left of June to furlough somebody. So if you haven't furloughed already for the first time, uh, then unfortunately those employees can't go in. So, uh, as I said, the new scheme from 1st of July will only be available to people who've previously been furloughed under the current scheme. And it's very much the government's intention to start the wind down process of, uh, of clearly what's a very expensive uh, uh, scheme. And one of the provisions for that is that under the new scheme, the number of employees that can be claimed for cannot exceed the number previously claimed for. So, uh, for example, if you've had 20 employees on furlough and you bring them back, so you now only have 19 and then you work with 19 for a bit, you can't put that 20th employee back on furlough because your claim number will then go up. Um, so it is worth thinking about that before you look at bringing somebody out that essentially once they come out of furlough now, that will be it. They can't go back onto it. Um, flexi furlough, which we're going to talk about a bit later on, is obviously going to be a new feature of, of the uh, new furlough scheme that's going to be available from the 1st of July. So that's quite an exciting prospect for many employers. Um, the new scheme will still allow employers to top up. So again, if you're an employer who's paying that extra 20% uh, for your workforce, that still will be available for you. 
um, but it will still be the same basic principle. So no work permitted during periods of furlough, save for training and volunteering. And, and many of you will have seen the warning messages coming out of HMRC uh, that they are taking furlough fraud very seriously. So they will be uh, most likely auditing an awful lot of claims. So be prepared, keep your paperwork, be prepared that you're going to have your claims looked at in the future by uh, HMRC who are looking to um, unpick some of those uh, furlough decisions. And the uh, job retention scheme is going to taper out uh, and close by the 30th of, uh, 31st of October. So that will be the last uh, day. Uh, and I've uh, shamelessly stolen this from the government um, in terms of their uh, uh, excellent illustration of how it's going to work. So this is the tapering of furlough. So as you can see, July, we're going to continue as was under the current system. Uh, still 80% of wages contributed by the government, still uh, employer NICs and pension contributions paid for by the government. In August, the employer NICs and pension contributions will shift over, so they will be paid for by the employer, so there will be a small cost to uh, employers who, start, who continue furlough through August. In September, add to that 10% of wages, so the government will contribute 10%, employer will pay 10%, uh, and then in October, we move 60% on the employer and 20%, uh, sorry, 60% from the government and 20% from the employer. So as you can see, slowly tapering down to reduce the cost on the government and move that cost over um, to the employer. So that's furlough, um, but unfurlough. So I'm gonna hand back to Jackie to talk about that. Thanks, David. Um, so unfurloughing, this may be something that um, you as an employer have already um, looked at because you were rotating your staff to be fair to everybody or to allow for breaks, to cover sickness, all business picked up. Um, so it may not be unfamiliar to you, but obviously all employers now um, will have to start thinking about this. So you need to start planning. Obviously, there needs to be a short term plan. Um, the scheme is going to go on for a while in various forms. So. Um, you can dip your toe in the water to see how things are, perhaps have a short term plan. Obviously, things change by the minute, so that's going to have to be adaptable and subject to review. And then a more long term plan for the future. So perhaps you're going to use this time to think, well, actually, we're going to have to make some um, permanent changes um, going forward. Um, in terms of that planning, obviously, um, helpful in terms of getting buy in to involve your staff in that um, to get um, their views. Um, you'll certainly need to communicate that to staff, both individuals and uh, communally to the whole workforce as to what you're planning to do with um, bringing people back or, or not. Um, there may be a formal agreement in place with, you may have unions, so you may have to do that anyway and um, consult at an early stage and communicate. In terms of individuals, obviously, in relation to their own personal position, um, you'd have to communicate with them in writing, but it makes sense to communicate with the whole workforce in writing so they understand um, what, what's going on. And it'll be the, the when, the how and the who, you know, what's, what's going to happen. Um, so, um, as I say, that should be in discussion with all employees. You'll have effective lines of communication now. You might have your preferred way of doing things, depends on the size of your workforce. So video meetings, conference calls phone, text, email, however you do it, a telephone. In terms of timing, um, this is obviously dictated by your business and it, you may need to get people back sooner, but obviously to benefit under the scheme, there's a three week minimum period at present. So you, in terms of timing, you have to be careful with that, that you don't lose out under, under the scheme. So what will this look like? Um, what are you bringing people back to? Um, again, in terms of your planning, um, are you going to bring people back to, this, to the same position? Can you do that? Um, obviously, operational requirements may dictate what things look like. So you may be thinking about bringing people back, but to different jobs or different hours, reduced hours. I mean, maybe may many changes that you need to make either on a short term or long term basis. Um, so you'll need to, to think that through uh, in terms of um, how you're going to affect those changes. And we'll come on to that later in, in the webinar as to how you, you do change um, terms and conditions of employment. Um, one of the things you obviously need to consider is uh, the workplace. 
you talk about bringing people out of the scheme, are you actually physically bringing them back to the um, workplace um, premises or are you able to bring them back but they work from home or is it going to be a mixture, um, perhaps a skeleton crew uh, in the workplace and some people working at home or staged, gradually bringing people back to work premises. And obviously this, this brings us to one of the key factors in terms of unfurloughing people um, in this current climate and that's health and safety, which is going to be a real driver here. Um, I'm not going to go into any real detail on this because obviously every business is, is completely different and has different restrictions in place uh, day to day. Um, so I'm just going to provide an, an overview. Now employers as you'll be aware, have a duty to safeguard an employee's health and safety at work as far as is reasonably practicable and to foresee any risk or harm that could come to them in the workplace. And part of that is protecting people against um, diseases such as COVID-19. And the government has um, brought out um, in-depth guidance for various sectors and various types of workplace on health and safety um, requirements and, and um, five steps employers should be considering taking um, but also um, the health and safety executive has advice on its website uh, one of the key things that employers will have to consider first and foremost is a risk assessment now, obviously, if employers are bringing people back to the physical workplace, um, then that'd be a more um, in-depth uh, risk assessment that's required. But equally, even if people are working from home, employers still have to consider the risks there and um, be alive to um, data protection issues, whether employees have the right equipment, um, but also in terms of mental health and so on, People have various um, arrangements in place, looking after children and so on, timing of meetings, calls, etc. So all those things have to be considered in terms of health and safety and, and the well-being of employees at home. But as I say, in the physical workplace, that's going to require a far greater risk assessment in terms of social distancing, whether that's going to be two metres or down to one metres shortly, and deep cleaning, the commute to work. Um, and trying to reduce contact between um, groups of people and so on. And now, if the employer falls foul of any of those obligations in terms of health and safety, that could give rise um, to a number of claims. Uh, breaches of health and safety could be, um, give rise to constructive unfair dismissal claim. The employee says they're being forced back into an unsafe place of work. There could be discrimination issues. We could have whistleblowing claims, i.e. the employee complains that health and safety isn't being taken seriously and they're being put at risk and they bring a claim. So obviously employers have to um, do their homework, uh, assess the risks and see how those risks might be um, got ridden of or at least controlled um, to a safe extent. And employers should be involved in that process or at least being given copies of any risk assessments and see what measures that employer is, is thinking of bringing in so they can be reassured and so that you stave off claims and people are more confident about returning to the workplace. OK, so moving on, um, who are we talking about um, in terms of unfurlowing? Unless you're thinking about bringing back the entire workforce or entire part of a business, you may have decisions to make as to who you're choosing to bring back. And as employers, you'll be aware that um, that will require you being careful about uh, not to inadvertently discriminate against groups of people, particularly protected groups of people uh, for um, unlawfully discriminatory reasons. So you'd have to have um, fair and objective business reasons for why you are choosing certain people to come back and apply um, fair and objective selection criteria into, to groups of people who carry out the same role in terms of who's, who's coming back at least first perhaps um, um, rather than others. Now before you get to that stage one thing you might consider and you may have considered this in terms of who you furloughed in the first place and that's looking at um, how employees feel about this and um, establishing what their position is, what their preference would be, 
or even um, having volunteers um, offer up to stay on, on furlough. So that may be something you consider. However, if the, the roles are business critical, that's not going to be an option, but certainly may take the pain out of the process. Otherwise, you'd have to have a grid score employees um, appropriately and then select who's, who's going to um, return. In terms of the process, um, well, the first thing is to check the agreement you had in place when they were put on furlough, if you had a written agreement, um, because that should say something about um, when furlough ends and the notice you're going to give um, in terms of a return date. I mean, again, that could be dictated by the scheme itself and having that three week um, minimum period. Um, if you don't have any period in the agreement, then it's be reasonable notice. Employees should be ready to come back at short notice, but obviously they've got um, children, et cetera, caring obligations. So you need to give them as much notice as possible. Um, and again, if you are changing things up and they're not returning to the same role, then you'd have to carry out a process with those employees in terms of changing their contracts. So you might have to give them greater notice to, to achieve that. Uh, again, if you're bringing them back to the physical workplace, they'd have to be reassured about the health and safety um, considerations and receive a copy of a risk assessment. So they were, um, again, confident about returning to the workplace. Now, what if employees refuse to come back to work? We'll come to vulnerable protected employees in a minute who would most likely to be those individuals who are fearful about coming back. Um, but you can't make that assumption you don't know, everybody's been impacted differently by this um, pandemic. Um, and even the most robust may have vulnerabilities or concerns about coming back to work. Now, hopefully, when you've gone through your planning process and been speaking, communicating to employees about all the things you're doing in terms of making the workplace safe, they're reassured so you won't have this issue. But all you can do is, again, reassure those employees, understand what their concerns are and try and address these. Uh, be patient, listen, um, be flexible if you can be. Um, what you don't want to be is heavy handed. You don't want um, to have grievances raised. You don't want to have to get bogged down in a disciplinary, which is going to be difficult to manage uh, remotely, potentially, um, and potential claims. So ideally, you try and be as flexible as possible. Um, it may be that you consider that actually you can leave that individual on furlough for a period if they've got legitimate concerns. However, if it really is a conduct issue, then you are within your rights to start a disciplinary process with that individual because they're refusing to obey lawful um, employer's instructions. Um, and that, as I say, that could be a conduct issue, but tread, tread carefully with those individuals. So vulnerable employees, um, who are they? Um, well, carers, so they might be older people, um, people with disabilities and so on, shielding employees, so who, have, um, who are clinically vulnerable, have particular health conditions or older and so on. Um, there are also protected categories of employees who are protected from unlawful discrimination, such as those who are dis disabled under the Equality Act, and that could be people with mental or physical disabilities, um, pregnant employees, um, older um, employees. Um, but also don't forget people who have lost um, loved ones during this crisis, so the bereaved. And, and don't forget the non-furloughed. Um, their mental health may have suffered during this. So everybody has some kind of vulnerability, but there are some individuals who are um, protected and um, classes, um, extremely vulnerable and with those individuals if you're proposing to bring them back to the workplace well the first starting point from the government is that they should work from home in the first instance if that is possible as with all employees um, and certainly those individuals should be staying at home shielding is lifting now um, but um, they should be treated in a certain way and it seems that the, the advice is if at all possible keep them on furlough for a period. Obviously that will be uh, subject to cost considerations and so on, but if that would be the easiest solution. But um, don't make assumptions about 
uh, those categories of individuals. Um, and don't take the easy way out if it's more difficult to perhaps to make a reasonable adjustment to um, allow somebody with a disability to work from home um, rather than putting them on furlough. You need to consider that. Um, and don't make assumptions, circle to typical assumptions that perhaps women are the primary child carers anymore and that they can't work from home despite having um, children or that they're the person who has that responsibility. So I think. Again, you need to be sensitive uh, about their particular issues, be very careful in the selection process, choices about who's coming back to work. I think establish what um, their personal preferences are so that you can build that into your planning process in terms of who's, who's coming back. But if you make decisions um, that just make assumptions, you could be um, at risk of discrimination claims and claims regarding health and safety. Okay, I think that's all I have to say about unfurloughing. I'm going to hand over to David to talk through flexi furlough. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, so um, there we've heard uh, all about the main decision, obviously, whether you're going to bring somebody back from furlough or not. Um, but now we're going to look a little bit at flexi furlough, which is, um, to some extent, the middle ground that you can use to try and bring the workforce back um, uh, at a, in a phased way. So we know from the 1st of July uh, that flexi furlough is going to be available uh, to uh, employees who've previously been furloughed. The guidance we have at the moment is that any amount of time and any shift pattern will be available. So you um, won't be uh, limited only to shift working employees that essentially you could have a, an employee who works five days a week on a salary. Uh, you could have a conversation with them about a reduced uh, day shift pattern or a reduced hour shift pattern. But at its core, this flexibility needs to be agreed. So again, when you're having those conversations about bringing people back and you're looking at flexi furlough as an option, remember you need the employee to agree the arrangement as well. And that arrangement needs to be confirmed in writing. Um, so this is probably going to have a knock on effect, um, maybe for slightly more dynamic flexi patterns. Uh, it's likely what you're going to need to do is fix a flexible pattern for a specific period of time. Uh, so say three days a week uh, for the whole of July, so that you can agree that in writing and set out the start and end date of that flexible period, rather than necessarily taking on a, a week by week basis. Um, for those hours or days that the individual comes into work, then the employer uh, is going to have to pay them as usual, uh, including paying things like tax, uh, NICs, and also pension contributions. And then the government will cover those normal working hours that the employee is uh, furloughed for. And that's going to be by reference to their usual working time. So again, the starting point is going to be to look at their contract, see what they uh, should be working and then looking at whether there's some flexibility in there. Um, now, this is all quite brief because at the moment, uh, we're, we're all holding our breath for tomorrow when we will get the uh, hopefully detailed uh, rules on this flexi furlough scheme. But I thought the best way to look at it was to um, look at maybe a couple of examples because this scheme, I'm sure you'll see straight away, fits very nicely with employees who were already on contracts of day rates or hourly rates. Um, it's it's quite straightforward to see that if someone's working on an hourly rate and you bring them in for a few hours every day and they agree that you've already got that hourly rate probably agreed in the contracts so there's not going to be a dispute I see the big problem coming with exactly those uh, employees who are on salaries to work um, five days a week and what often you get in those contracts is that even though the contract says it's a 37 and a half or 40 hour a week uh, contract you often find that it has a clause in there saying that the employee will work such additional hours without further remuneration as are required by the role. And what you may find is that some employers are asking their employees to come back four days a week, but essentially to do five days of work in four days, um, simply so that they can save the salary of one day. And I think that's where uh, disputes are likely going to occur. As I said, it comes back to that having to agree the arrangement with the employee and you may find that if you're asking employees to agree arrangements that then don't uh, materialize in quite the same way as they've been agreed 
disputes are going to arise and uh, and, and this comes back to a possible um, uh, pay claim you may find that and again you may find grievances arising out of this that it's um, an abuse of the, the scheme so certainly when you're looking at your salaried employees with um, with those sort of non fixed hours as such uh, it is going to take some careful thought as to how you're going to bring those people back and how you're going to manage their workload so that they don't feel that it's it's being abused so as I said, hopefully we'll get uh, announcements tomorrow and there'll be some updates about how this is actually going to work. But it's it's going to be a, a question of considering the individual arrangements and agreeing them with, with the employee. So that takes us on to and beyond. So we're going to look at a few other things um, that, that can be thought about by employers when they're looking at the options available to them um, for bringing people back. Uh, we're going to look at paid or unpaid leave so periods of that obviously one thing to remember is that because the employment relationship continues throughout furlough leave continues to accrue so certainly if you have employees who are going to be off from march all the way through to october they're going to potentially have a substantial amount of holiday that needs to be taken and that's something to think about but there's also other periods of leave that we can look at so we're going to um, run through those uh, and then jackie's going to talk about contract variations and, and reorganizations and also redundancies and uh, dismissals but one thing to bear in mind uh, whenever we're looking at these other options is to think about how they might uh, interrelate with the scheme uh, and whether or not there's any benefit to exercising them during a period of furlough so that there's uh, an option to offset the cost. Um, and that one almost straight away runs into holiday. Uh, so as I said, employees are likely to have a substantial amount of holiday. Um, they're probably not going to be that keen to take any of it, given that uh, it's quite difficult to go anywhere or do anything at the moment. Um, but as we're slowly emerging from the lockdown, people may start wanting to take some holiday, take some short breaks, maybe staying in the UK. Um, for employees on furlough, um, it is possible to take holiday. We know that. And if you allow holiday to be taken, uh, the best advice is you top up that pay to their normal, uh, their normal rate of pay, but obviously that's not going to impact on the furlough claim. So again, there's a benefit there to allowing holiday during periods of furlough because there's an opportunity to offset some of that cost by continuing your claims under the furlough scheme. Um, but one other thing to remember is that, uh, and a lot of employers forget this, is that they actually have a right to instruct employees to take holiday. Um, you have to give uh, the minimum notice, so twice as much um, as the length of time that they want to take off. But if you need to manage that holiday, then you might think about um, instructing an employee to take a period of holiday during furlough or bringing them back from furlough and then instructing them to take holiday as well. So that's, uh, that's another option to manage in terms of bringing people back to the workplace. Um, statutory leaves, um, so, Best example here is a parental leave, so the 18 weeks of parental leave that uh, parents can take uh, in the first 18 years of a child's life. Some employees may wish to, to exercise that right. They may um, want to look at taking that parental leave when furlough comes to an end. So that's certainly something that we, we could uh, uh, look at as an option. Um, sick leave, again, to continue uh, to consider when uh, possibly in relation to those uh, more vulnerable employees that Jackie was talking about earlier. You may find that furlough comes to an end, but then the employee still reports sick. Uh, and we know now that um, SSP certainly has been extended so that it can be uh, covering, for example, employees who are told to uh, stay at home through the government's test and trace system. Um, so obviously there you're gonna have to consider, do you have company sick pay? How will that um, how would that work and and then SSP for for where there is no uh, company sick pay and what that period's going to look like so that's another option to look at. Um, you could then have a conversation about a possible sabbatical with uh, your workforce in terms of bringing uh, furlough to an end and asking the employee actually if they'll take a period of unpaid leave. Um, but something uh, you need to think about obviously is how that's going to work because most employees are not going to agree to it unless there's some sort of guarantee. In terms of their return and and it's unlikely you're going to be able to offer a guarantee of a, of a job to come back to um, but all these options again coming back to what Jackie said in terms of 
being flexible and, and understanding the needs of the workforce as well as just um, the business operations. These options might be available to those uh, employees with childcare responsibilities, um, where they're vulnerable employees, so certainly where they're looking at other options um, to keep themselves away from the workplace. Uh, and they may also um, give you an alternative to a redundancy. So when you're looking at redundancies, it may be that these are options that you should uh, consider before you move on to a dismissal. As I said, timing, important in terms of balancing them. So is there any option to uh, offset them against the claims that you can put through the furlough scheme? Um, and also be cautious in terms of creating a claim. Remember that uh, that, that duty of um, mutual trust and confidence that runs through the employment relationship in everything you do. Forcing an employee to take some holiday, albeit it's a legal right that you have, you still have to be careful in how you exercise that right and act reasonably. Um, and so there is that potential that you are heavy handed in how you require employees to take time off. Uh, and that could create a breach of trust and confidence, which would then lead to a constructive unfair dismissal claim. And as, uh, as I said earlier, in terms of sabbatical, what can you agree with the employee in terms of them returning to work? Um, can you give them a job at the end? So if they take a month off as unpaid um, uh, leave, is it guaranteed they will return to a job? Or is it that you will have to have a conversation with them again about potential redundancies at the end of that period if, if things haven't picked up? Um, so again, you're going to need to be quite honest, I would say, with the employees if you want to be able to try and agree a sabbatical because it will be just that. It needs to be an agreement between, between both parties. Um, so that's a rattle through of uh, some other things that you can think about. Um, but I'm going to hand back over to Jackie to talk about reorgs. Thanks, David. Um... So all change. Um, now, employers may be taking on some opportunity if they can't go back to the way things were, or indeed um, they think of a better way of doing things going forward, or need to uh, bring in some changes to anticipate what could happen in the future. There are many employers at the start of this who looked at their contracts to see if there was a layoff clause or any flexibility around reduced um, working um, but often those layoff clauses were something quite historic for certain industries so they didn't have those in there so even if you're not thinking about changing hours or so on now you might be wanting to change contracts to build in some options for um, if there's another wave or you have to um, go back into lockdown again um, so as, as I say it could be reactive or responsive the changes that you're um, proposing to make and it may be that now's the time to look at this um, in conjunction with the scheme so you can hit the ground running when people come out of the scheme or if you're doing it in stages. So um, can you vary your employees contracts? So let's say it could be hours, it could be days of work, it could be the role itself, salary reductions, you might want to retrain, upskill, you might even want to second people, various options, various changes um, even to the workplace and so on. Um, how do you go about this? Well, the starting point, the ideal way to introduce any change within employees to get their consent. So you'd want to consult with them, explain the business rationale behind what you're trying to achieve and get them to buy into this. Now, obviously, the more positive the change or the smaller the change, the easier it will be to get employees' consent. Um, and obviously the, the darker the background against which the change is being presented, again, you might get the employee's consent to this. Or if it's a temporary change, again, there might be more uh, scope for agreement there um, if it's not going to be permanent. And there may be some upside later on, you might be able to offer something when things get good again. So I'd say that's, that's the ideal to get employee's consent. Um, check the contract um, of employment. There may be an express contractual right to make changes to employees' terms, of, terms and conditions in there. Um, it's unusual, and when it's in there, it's often for minor changes. So it's, you'll find um, you're often advised oh, um, not to use that clause because there are risks attached to it, particularly where you're making substantive changes to salary, reducing hours, and so on. Um, there's a risk that it could backfire. And employees say, okay, that, that clause is in there, but you have a duty of trust and confidence towards me not to be using clauses like that um, where there are substantive changes to be made rather than just minor changes to the contract. If you do decide to rely on a clause like that, 
then you might go ahead, introduce it. Obviously, you consult about why you're doing this um, with the employees concerned. Um, and then you might introduce it and then hope for the best and that people work to those changes. So by implication, they have accepted those changes. But that's quite a risky um, strategy. Um, but again, it depends upon what changes you're, you're making and the climate that we're in. Employees might be more amenable to accepting changes if the um, downside is, is losing their job. Um, if there are going to be substantive changes and if there are, um, there's a likelihood that those employees are just not going to accept or you've gone through those other stages consulting and trying to get consent, then the more draconian approach in terms of affecting a change to employees' contracts is to dismiss and re-engage. So what you would do is give the employee notice, look at their contract, see what that notice is to terminate their old contract and re-employ them on the new terms. Now, if you give notice, you are dismissing that employee and if they don't like the new contract, then there's a risk that they um, don't accept this and that you find yourself uh, with a claim for unfair dismissal where those employees have more than two years continuous service. So again, that's a risky strategy as you could end up with a lot of unfair dismissal claims. Now, if you have good business reasons for why you wanted to bring those changes in in the first place, you should be able to defend those claims on the basis there was a good business reason for those. You followed a fair process in consulting with employees and look at the climate. You had no option but to do this. And um, looking at your workforce, the number of employees who, who accepted this or not. Again, it may be that in introducing these changes, some categories of employees are more adversely impacted than others. So you've got to be careful about potential discrimination there for certain groups, as that could give rise to another claim. Um, you've also got to be careful where uh, there are 20 plus employees contracts that you're considering um, changing and you're going through this dismiss and re-engage process. Um, where there are 20 dismissals contemplated that could give rise to a collective redundancy situation so if you have that number of employees and you think it's unlikely that in the consultation process they're going to agree to the changes and you're going to have to actually give notice then you're better off going through a collective process so that would involve um, if you don't have elected reps in place already electing representatives and having collective and individual consultation um, before um, trying to um, make those dismissals. So that's just something to, to bear in mind and weigh up the risks. If you don't go through that and you think, oh, I'm sure I'm gonna get 19 people to agree to it, ultimately, um, if I dismiss them, um, and you don't elect reps, you could face um, claims for protective awards for failing to consult. So it's a difficult area but certainly plenty of scope for changing contracts now and as I say, building in some flexibility for the future because um, the economic circumstances are such for many businesses that um, it has to be seen in that context. So that leads me on to dismissals and redundancies rather depressingly. Um, and in my opening slide talked about um, the survey from people management where a number of employees had been contemplating this but the scheme staved off those redundancies so now this is going to come back to the fore and indeed there are many businesses where that's happening already perhaps so in terms of timing um, if employers are thinking they may have to do this when should they do it should they do it now during the scheme can they do it or should they wait um, so can you make redundancies um, during the government scheme? Well, yes, the government guidance has confirmed that there's no reason why you can't do that. Um, so you could potentially do that and potentially give notice of termination, have people potentially working or serving out their notice during um, the scheme. And there's a benefit, obviously, in terms of the costs being covered to a certain extent under the scheme. However, there are pros and cons of this. Um, if you go ahead and make redundancies um, during the scheme, um, there is a potential risk that an employee might bring a claim for unfair dismissal 
on the basis that it was a breach of trust and confidence um, as to why you couldn't wait for the scheme to um, end before embarking on this process um, rather than making redundancies um, before that. So that may be something that employees raise as an argument that the redundancy itself is, is unfair. Um, there may be uh, negative reputational um, repercussions. Um, Gordon Ramsay was in the press when he made a number of employees redundant during the scheme. Uh, obviously that all fell upon the taxpayer. Uh, so there may be reputational issues there as to why you couldn't wait. Um, but again, it's, it's weighing it up, um, the cost benefit analysis and risks of that. And it may be that, um, as we were talking about, and David is explaining that um, rights continue to accrue day by day, um, holiday continues to accrue. So costs are building up. Employees' continuity of service increases. So those who might not have been entitled to a redundancy payment before because they're under two years acquire those two years. And it may be that employers just can't wait any longer. They're going to have to affect those redundancies sooner rather than later. Now, there are certain practicalities and challenges of going through any redundancy process, but particularly in this climate where that's going to have to be um, conducted remotely to a certain extent, um, particularly where you've got collective redundancy, so where you've got more than 20 um, uh, potential dismissals being contemplated. Um, that takes you into collective redundancy territory. So as I said previously in relation to reorganisations, you'd have to elect reps if you don't have them in place and go through a collective consultation process. And there are certain timings around that, certain minimum consultation periods dependent upon the number of employees that you're proposing to make redundant. So where there's 20 plus um, you're proposing to make redundant within the 90 day period uh, and establishment, that's 30 days, but there's 100 plus, that's 45 days consultation before you can um, affect any redundancies. So that all has to be considered. Um, communication systems, obviously you've had to deal with those, but that's going to be quite difficult trying to arrange for employees to have um, communication with their reps and so on. So it's going to be a, a much more difficult process um, and have greater challenges. And the fairness of that redundancy will be scrutinised by a tribunal because it's likely that employees may well bring claims because of the climate, because of the um, difficulties in, in obtaining new employment. They may just consider that they will, they will challenge any dismissal through the tribunals. So those decisions could be scrutinised in terms of the fairness of any process. And it's not just collective consultation, obviously, there's got to be individual consultation alongside that. That may be easier in terms of um, consulting with an individual regarding a redundancy. Um, if you are um, reducing down um, a role where there's a group of employees carrying out the same roles, then you're going to have to get into selection, as we talked about selection decisions and criteria for bringing people out of furlough, where they all do the same role. Again, you're going to have to look at that and look at your criteria, look at your business rationale, make sure that that's not discriminatory in any way. Now, obviously, decisions have been made to place people on furlough, but there may, may have been different reasons why they were placed on furlough, which may not carry across to selecting for redundancy. And I think you've got to be careful if you took the decision to place people on furlough who had child caring responsibilities or who were disabled or who were older, that you don't use that as your criteria in terms of and selecting for redundancy. So you have to consider your pools and the selection criteria, be careful about discrimination. Um, alternatives, you're really going to have to get creative, um, try and avoid redundancies in the first place. Obviously, perhaps the leave options that David was talking about, um, perhaps change to the contract, that could be something you, you try and discuss before you get into redundancies. Um, upskilling, retraining, uh, demotions and maybe employees who would be happier to take a lower role and still have a job um, rather than be made redundant. So lots of considerations there to try and avoid uh, redundancies in the first place.